Gunther, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. So how did you get into F1 racing? Oof. Uh, uh, the it's short not, version. Yeah, short first of it. I was <laughs> going to say how much time have you got? No, the short version is, uh, uh, is uh, I worked I worked in motorsport since '86. I worked in rallying, and uh, sometime in 2001, I got a phone call uh, from the secretary of Mr. Nicky Lauda asking that um, Lauda, Mr. Lauda, wants to speak with me, and uh, I spoke with him, and uh, uh, we agreed to have dinner together. And the next morning after the dinner. He called me up and said, you're going to work for me. That, that was my entrance to Formula One in, a quick, in quick words, you know. And that, war, that was when he was the uh, team principal at Jaguar Racing uh, in Formula One. And uh, that, that is how I started in Formula One. But motorsports I do since 86. You started as a mechanic, right? Correct. I started as a mechanic in 86 uh, in rallying, in world rallying. And how does going from mechanic to now being a team principal inform you? Do you think it gives you an edge? I don't know if it, it, it gives me an edge, but for sure it gives me uh, it gives me an advantage. I mean, uh, it's very difficult to uh, uh, pull the wool over my eyes, you know, because I've done uh, quite a bit in, in racing. I was technical director. I, I did a lot of stuff. Uh, I, I run my own business. Uh, I've got my own personal business uh, in the States. So uh, I think I know in general a little bit of everything what is happening in an F1 team, because an F1 team is nothing else than a, a company which is doing a lot of different things. Talk more about that. What do you mean it's a company doing a lot of different things? Uh, first of all, you start off, you go racing. So you need, you're running a race team, which is a lot of emotions. You need to be uh, race smart, race clever, you know, always competing. You know, you always try to have an edge over somebody else. Then you've got the technology behind, which is the car. So you need to be technically, uh, uh, you need to know what you're doing technically because you've got a big design team. The technology in F1 is at the forefront, you know, to a lot of other stuff. You always develop something. You need to do a lot of other things. You have got HR because you're dealing with a lot of people in a company. You got the finance because you always run out of money in racing. Because uh, if you have got money, you're going to spend it to go faster. Uh, and you need to run a business. You need to have that money coming in. So you need to sell sponsorship and uh, or report back to the board, uh, to the investor in the team and tell them what you're doing with money. So. Uh, as you see, there is a lot of things in which uh, is like a, like, like, a big, uh, like a big corporate in small. So you think of yourself as a CEO? Yeah, I mean, that is what we are these days. I mean, the team principal uh, role is mainly on the racetrack where you, where you go racing and you represent the team when you talk about regulations and stuff like this. But in the end, on, on a Monday, you're like a CEO. So go back to the beginning. So, so at some point you pitched Gene Haas on starting an F1 team, right? What was your goal at that point? To have an F1 team. <laughs> How has your goal, have your goals changed from then to now? No, no, to explain a little bit. Uh, at the time, uh, I live in the States. I moved to the United States in uh, 2006. And uh, I worked in NASCAR. Then I set up my own company, as I said before. And then I, had, I looked at that and I uh, said, there is maybe an opportunity to have a US F1 team, you know. With the, uh, and uh, I wrote up a business plan, as you do normally when you start a business. and. Uh, uh, just went around to, uh, uh, to pitch it to people which could invest in something like this because the investment at the time was very high. It's still very high. Now it's not possible anymore to do an F1 team, a new one. Went around and uh, had a, uh, quite a few uh, nays, but that is normal. You know, when you pitch something, you don't have to get desperate. And I wasn't desperate because I had my own company. And then I met Mr. Haas uh, and uh, we spoke over a year about it. I had to explain to him how I would do it. Just the same question I like get now. How, uh, how are you going to do it? Uh, and obviously he was looking if I actually would be capable of doing it. That's why he waited this long, which be because it's a big investment and he didn't want to fail. Mr. Haas doesn't like failure, you know, and going into F1 is very difficult because of the, all the different things you need to cover in it. So, and uh, uh, at some stage he said, that is, uh, yes, uh, let's do it. How's the business doing? Business is doing business is tough. I mean, uh, obviously, business in the beginning was uh, based on his investments. If you start up a company, but I think uh, Mr. Haas is a very smart person. I think he saw in his vision he saw that F1 will be growing. That's what I guess because he doesn't do anything just for doing it. You know, obviously, we are the smallest team in Formula One. I think uh, we we try to be the most efficient one, uh, just doing things different. We came into Formula One with a complete different model. Because before, uh, when, you ca when the teams came in, which are not around anymore, they came in and they were clever people, but 
going into Formula One is very difficult because the people which are here are very good. So what you need to catch up to them how you need to do it. You need to do it better and more of it. Doing it better is very difficult because as I said, people doing it, they are very smart. Doing more of it, it takes a lot of money. And normally investors, either they run out of money or the enthusiasm because they cannot catch up. So what we decided to do is to join with the big team, which is Ferrari, and buy as much as, they, as you can buy by regulation from them. So we don't have to invest money in, I give you an example, a steering I can have one car. They are very sophisticated, it's a very sophisticated part of engineering. You share that with them. We share that with them because if we do our own, it will take us years to do the same. And if we, once we get there to do the same, it will not be any better because I think there, there, there is no uh, competitive advantage anymore. So we said what we can buy, we buy and develop the stuff which makes the difference. It's the aerodynamics, you know, and how you race the car and things like this. They have to be focused on that for also we are the smallest teams because a lot of things we don't do ourselves, the suspension, the hydraulics, the electronics, uh, the gearbox, we don't do ourselves, we buy it because it's legal to you buy. You rent it? Or you we, buy, we buy it and some release because some, some of the technology, they would, Ferrari wouldn't sell it to you, or to me. So, <laughs> it's too proprietary. Yeah, exactly, yeah. When you say you're the smallest team, what do you mean? Uh, we are uh, people-wise uh, only a little bit over 200 people, even in the budget cup. Uh, but already before, without the budget cap, we were this small team because we don't need so many people because we buy some of the stuff and we, we try to work very efficient. So you're saying it's harder to become profitable because you're a smaller team, ultimately? N no, no. Uh, profitable should be easier because we spend less on, on these people. But uh, the profitability now, it's, I think it's for everybody about the same because we are uh, running under a budget cap. Uh, for the car, for going competing, you, uh, everybody has to spend about the same amount. Obviously, some people spend more on the driver. There is things outside of the budget cap, like the driver, and uh, there's a, uh, like travel. But in the end, we are all in the range between, uh, maybe the, the big teams spend 50 million more in the comp uh, racing. Obviously, marketing that is complete outside the budget cap, you could spend whatever you want. So uh, uh, we are the smallest one, uh, and, and that for, Coming profitable, I hope we achieve it this year or next year. You know, that would be one it's of the goals. It's not profitable now. Not, not in the moment. In the moment, I think we, have, we are close to a break even. Uh, but uh, uh, we will become profitable because every a business uh, uh, to, to assure that you continue, you need to be profitable because it cannot be uh, just an investment project. Has it been profitable up until this point at all? No, not at all yet, no. So is the budget cap a good thing because it levels the playing field? Absolutely. It's a, it's a very good thing. It levels the playing field. Uh, uh, also, anybody investing in it knows how much you're going to spend. Before it was always like this. You, you would never know how much, you're gonna, how much you need to spend because how long is a piece of string? You know, uh, it's like you could spend more and more and having success or, or not having success. The other thing I think what the budget cap did is the value of the teams got up because of that reason. Because if you invest in a race team now, you know how much it's going to cost you. Or oh, plus minus, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 million. But things you have got in control before somebody investing in a race team didn't know if he would spend 200 million a year or half a billion a year. There was uh, everything in between. So what about the difference between Liberty? That's one of the differences when Liberty took over the sport. You were in it well before the acquisition. How else did it change? It changed quite a lot. I think the popularity went up. Uh, I think we opened the door to the United States, which is a very important market for anything. You know, it's still the biggest economy in the world. You know, we never have to ignore that with over 300 million people, you know, so we needed to get in there. I think that was neglected in the old days. Do you think you benefit in the United States because you're the only American team, American owned? I think we benefit a little bit, but uh, uh, F1 is such a global sport, so it doesn't really make uh, a difference which na nationality the team is. So you were saying the expansion of the sport, Drive to Survive, for instance, came in the Liberty days. Do you think that that's had a big effect? Big effect, also big effect, Liberty Media, uh, uh, exploiting social media, which before wasn't done, open up new market like uh, the United States, uh, uh, a lot of going more to the Middle East, you know, uh, I think uh, Liberty Media did a, a really good job to take 
the, the sport the next step from where they bought it. Obviously, they had a vision with it. Otherwise, they wouldn't make the investment. The smart people. What about other rules and regulations that have been implemented since? Uh, one of the other important things is since Liberty came, we had the new Concord Agreement, which is our commercial agreement with the, uh, with the promoter, with Formula One, with Liberty, basically. Uh, they, 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 they made the, what we call the price money, the share of the, uh, of the money, uh, a, a little bit more equal. It's still not equal between who is first and who is tenth, but they balance it a little bit better for the uh, teams further in the back because they needed the biggest support. So they brought a lot of stuff like this one there. They want to make it a very, they want to make it a business for everybody's taking part, not just a, 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 a race team come and go. They want a solid business with, uh, with 10 race teams, which are solid financially, which are solid uh, sportingly. And we can see that in the moment because the field was never as close together as it is now. So you think it's a good thing for, for a team like yours, which you're now in seventh, yeah. seventh place? I think it's a good for all the teams, you know, not only for us. I think it's a good, it's, it's, it's for the benefit of everybody in Formula One, even for the big ones, even if they would like to spend more money, but it keeps them under control. And because what are the, if you have got three very strong teams and the rest are bad, that's not good for the championship. I think as much as everybody likes to dominate something, in the end, we need to see the global picture and people see that, you know, that you need 10 competitive teams to have a good show, I call it. Are there 10 competitive teams? It still feels dominated by just a few. Uh, it's still, uh, it, 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 it seems dominated. I think it, there is three or four teams which are ahead of the other ones, but the, the budget cap and all these measures taken in, they will take time uh, and uh, that it levels the playing field. I said it when it came to the beginning, short term, it will change. We will get closer together, which we got, but we are not so close that any weekend somebody else could win. I think that in Formula One anyway will never happen. And I think it shouldn't happen because if you don't really, if, if it's just a lottery, then it's not a sport anymore. If somebody does a good job, he needs to be rewarded, in my opinion, you know. But I think it will change that every year somebody else will be leading the pack or will be the top three teams will be different each year. But I think we have to wait another three years until that to happen, until the budget cap, because some of these big teams they had such an advantage in technology, in uh, data, in uh, softwares, which they can apl uh, uh, apply, that the smaller teams need time to catch up. They will catch up, but i give you a good example. In the last two years, since the budget cap is in, all the teams score points. If you go back in history, that happened very rarely, you know. This year, I think in race two or three, everybody had scored points. You know, we need to see it a little bit like this. What you're saying is right. In the moment, there are four teams which are running away with the front of it, but the fight between the other ones, it's pretty intense. And before it was always yet one or two back markers, which couldn't even dream of points, you know. But now from P6 to P10, we are fighting out there for points every weekend because any of us could have that. And at some stage that will shift into one to 10, in my opinion. Obviously, year to year to year or every two years it will change a little bit. But look at Aston Martin. They catched up pretty quick from last year to this one. That was just possible because there was a budget cap. Otherwise, the other three would have run away. So I think it is possible uh, always, as I said, hard work needs to be rewarded. So if you do a good job over winter, I, I, I wouldn't like to see a balance of performance, as I call it. You know, that they say, oh, because you're good, you now uh, get uh, like carrying more weight or less power. I think it's Formula One. If you think about there is 10 teams, 20 different, 10 different teams, 20 different drivers. And in, in, Q, in Q1, I think it was in, in one of the last races, we were all within a second over a lap of one point, uh, uh, a minute and 20 seconds. It's quite amazing. You know, one tenth of a second or one second is not a lot of time. So how do you get even more competitive? Is it a matter of money? You cannot spend more. It's a, it's a matter of uh, uh, getting at the, to the top of the budget cap and a little bit of time that you can gain the experience what the other ones have got because now they cannot run away and do projects which we cannot afford to do. It's catching up game now and doing a good job. A, a lot now is about the talent. It's not about the money anymore. You know, it's like in any other sport. I mean, it's like how some people, you need to have the talent to start with and then you need to train a lot, which in our world is developing a lot. So that's part of your job as well. Yeah, oh, one of them. <laughs> the other piece of it is sponsorships. You, you mentioned the money comes in. How, how does that work? You've got MoneyGram as the title sponsor. We've spent some time with them. How did that come together? 
Uh, these things come together, first of all, I think, uh, uh, with exposing, with, with Formula One in general as a business growing, it is getting more and more interesting for uh, corporates and companies out there to invest, which means sponsor a, a team and take advantage of our exposure. And obviously, if the sport is doing good, it's easier to get sponsors. MoneyGram, I think MoneyGram coming to us was uh, very smart. I mean, it's an American company which want to get more uh, business global. It's the same with Haas Automation. Mr. Haas started this team because his company has automation. He wanted to have more global recognition and he thought Formula One was a, was a good platform. And it has proven, I mean, uh, the brand recognition is very good now for Haas. And I think MoneyGram is doing the same, trying to get out there in the world, telling them who MoneyGram is, what they can do for, for the people on the street, you know. And they came, I think, for, I always say, they were very smart when they came. They saw where Formula One is going. They said, let's try to get into Formula One. Let's try to get in with a smaller team or a midfield team, because in the big teams, you know, it's all about the big team. And with us, I think they get more about them because first of all, we want to be partners with them because we can learn from them. And for where we are as a team, we got actually a good recognition. We are the, still the youngest team. I mean, the second youngest team is about 25 years older than us and we are only in our eight season. So that says a lot. And they came on and says, these people have got a good following. You know, we are always present, you know, and uh, they came up at, uh, on at the right time when the price was still affordable for Formula One. I mean, the sponsorship prices go up, more popular the, the, the sport becomes, more it costs to get in there uh, for a sponsor. So I think they came at the right time. And I think, I mean, you said, you spoke with MoneyGram, they will tell you if it, if, if it is a good thing for them to do or not. I think they are very happy with the program in the moment. You also had some sponsorships that are no longer a Russian oligarch, Rich Energy. What happened there? And how have you learned from that? Absolutely, always learn, and uh, I can explain what happened there. I mean, with uh, with, uh, with Rich Energy, uh, I, I think in the beginning the business uh, the business model for them was sound. They had a big investor in it, which obviously, uh, in the end, he he didn't have anything. But there was something which wasn't working in the company. Uh, we got out what we wanted. We did what we promised we were going to do, and then w when they stopped uh, paying us, uh, we stopped uh, uh, having their brand on our car with the, uh, uh, with the uh, Ural Kali, with the, uh, with the brand. Obviously, when, when uh, uh, Ukraine was invaded by Russia, there was no, there was no way that we, could, that we could keep on going on with them. I mean, you know, but when you do a deal like this, you never think in 2000, it was 2022, that a, a war would break out, you know? So I think we got ended up there in a bad place, but I think where we reacted well, we were one of the, or, or we were the first ones to, tell the world we are actually uh, cutting our ties with them because of what happened, the invasion happened the same day in the evening. We, we, we took our uh, stickers off, off the car and everything we had. So it was a little bit unfortunate, but in the end, uh, we learned out of it, uh, obviously, but uh, this, this was experiences. They were not, we didn't go into these deals knowing what is happening. They all happened in, in a very weird way. So obviously we learned our lessons. We did a lot more due diligence with MoneyGram and uh, uh, I mean, in the end, uh, you know, we learn and got better. And Chipotle is also a sponsor. Absolutely, I've got other sponsors. Uh, Chipotle, they, uh, Chipotle never did any motorsport sponsorship. And I think they just uh, wanted to put the, their foot into Formula One, you know. Uh, and, and, and I think for them it's working as well. Uh, and hopefully uh, their experience is good and they extend or get bigger, uh, make their sponsorship, uh, sponsorship bigger. I think for them it's a bit trying out if it works or not. So how much time do you have to spend with the sponsors? Uh, I, I, it depends. I mean, I, I quite get on uh, with our sponsors, with MoneyGram, with, with all, the, all the senior management. I've got a very good relation and I think I enjoy to be with them, you know. So uh, I, when they need me and they're always, when they're around, I always talk with them. Obviously on the weekends, I've got a job to do to run a race team, but I'm always in contact with them. I, I, I really like them. I expect them. I respect them. but. Also, how that deal came together was very strange. It was very quick, you know. We had dinner and uh, I think the chemistry was right and they decided to do sponsorship as well. They had their numbers, but also the partnership. It's not only that they give us money. They, uh, I think our sponsors, they also know that we will try to do the best for them because that it's much, it's much easier to keep a sponsor, partner, than getting a new one. 
you know, if you get on with somebody, try to do the best that you always grow, grow, help them grow their business so you're sure that they stay with you. Do you recruit the sponsors or do they come to you? How does that work? It, it, it's, it's various. There is agencies which, which, which are after sponsors. We have got our own marketing department. I normally don't uh, 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 write to them myself. Or, but once we get in negotiations, I get involved uh, uh, at, normally quite at, uh, right at the beginning when somebody is there and they want to hear the real story about HACEF1. And a lot of people want that, you know. Uh, I just attend uh, a meeting, you know, and explain them why we are here, what we plan to do and uh, what we what we uh, what we could do for them. How, how do you think about their return on investment? I think uh, uh, I think on their return on investment, they need to have a return. Otherwise, there's no point to be here. So uh, I always tell them they need to do activations because it doesn't sell itself. But to use us for their activation programs, you know, and we always try to help it. That, that is what people don't see what we do for our sponsors. We always try to give them whatever they need that they can do activate. And then obviously they need to go back and see if it works for them or not. They do their, uh, need to do their own investigations if this sponsorship actually brings them more customers. So, how, I mean, we're talking about the business, obviously very important. You said you run it like a company. Does the, does the business, does the commercial aspect ever interfere, do you think, or run contrary to the racing, the engineering, the technical aspects here? No, it doesn't run contrary. It, it, the only thing is, uh, a better business you do, more you can give to the company to do more. You know, even if there is a budget cap, you can. There is stuff outside of the budget cap you can, you can do. So you always try to to, to get as much commercial uh, uh, deals done. So you have got a good basis of funding for the team. What about looking ahead? We're, we're, a big story of ours has been the expansion into the U.S. The adding the third race. Do you think there's a risk of overdoing it? Uh, I would say, and I speak a lot with Stefan Dominicali, the CEO of, of Formula One, about this. I think there is a risk to overdo it. And I think we know that we now need to stabilize the US. I think that the, 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 the growth over the last three years was massive. You know, what, we, what now needs to be thought, we cannot keep on adding races. I think three races is very good in the moment. I think now we need a period of stabilization. If you look back, uh, Austin was very smart as well. Uh, they came in in the beginning and they, I think, the, the, they lay the groundwork for Formula One in the in the US to come back to the US because they always put on a good race, a good show, they did a good job. And then the other races came along when Formula One was growing. Now I think we need to stabilize that we don't have a drop. And then maybe in two, three, four years, there is even potential for more races in the US because the US is a very big country. And I always try to explain to people in Europe here, it's like say, oh, three races in the USA, it's getting too much. I say, but think about it in Europe, we have got eight races, eight or nine races, and Barcelona is a, is a lot closer to Silverstone than Las Vegas to Miami. So there is space, you know, if you think it like this, if you see it like this. And I think there is space, but we, we don't have to rush it to grow it in the US in the moment. In the moment, I would say uh, we, we need to stabilize it. And I think they're doing a good job of it. Why? What's the risk? Uh, oversaturation, you know, it's just too much. People cannot keep up. People think it is now all about this. I mean, we now need to make people happy and some people will drop out of it, but I think people will drop out and drop in. I think I think uh, Formula One has got a good, the door is open to us now. It's not like, uh, we just need to keep it open now. What about adding more teams? How do you feel about that? Adding more teams, I mean, adding more teams is, uh, if, if it is an upside for everybody in F1, which means teams, FOM, I think everybody's fine, but just adding teams to have more teams to dilute the other ones. Why, why would any business do that? I mean, in the end, that, that it's a business. What, what would be additive? Uh, more income, basically, you know, just to add to the bottom line and uh, bringing more people, bringing more, uh, uh, if you bring more fans and spectators, that is adding financial. In the end, it's a business we need to run here, you know. What about the 2026 rules? I know people are, are looking ahead to that. Big changes when it comes to sustainability and the environmental standards. How are, how are you preparing? Uh, I mean, the, the 2026 rules on the chassis, they haven't started yet. Uh, on the engines, people work on it. As I said, uh, big aim uh, or, or, or big target sustainability. Uh, I think, uh, or not I think, we will get to net zero in Formula One in 2030. Uh, there is a lot of effort put into that one. And what I always try to explain to people is like the combustion engine, in a, a lot of people's opinion, and in my one as well, is not dead yet. We just need to find a way 
uh, uh, to be sustainable, you know, with different fuels. There's a lot of technology which can, which is being developed and can be developed to make this happen. Therefore, we stick with the, uh, with the combustion engine in 2030 or 2035, when in some countries you just can sell EV vehicles, uh, there will be still, I was told, over a billion cars in the world around in combustion engines. So we need to find solutions for that. Formula One is always a good place to develop technology like this, for, also for the road car, because we are very fast moving. Financially, there is a lot of investment money going in now to develop a fuel for our two, 2026 combustion engine, which needs to be sustainable, you know. So there's a lot of development coming and Formula One can help with that one to, for the mainstream uh, uh, industry, for the road cars to develop, to have a fuel which then can be produced in big quantities at cheap prices to, for the future, you know. So I think uh, uh, we, we, we are staying with the combustion engine. We, uh, we, there is more electricity percentage-wise than it's now on a Formula One car in 2026, but I think it's a good way and it's a good thing to do that, you know. And uh, people sometimes think, uh, why you still go with a, a combustion engine? Because we are developing something for the future, but not only for us, for the world as well. You can't do it uh, electric? Uh, you can do everything, but would it be us as it is now? And would it be uh, what we want to do? As I said, we, I think as Formula One, we always want to be at the forefront of technology. How do you get on with the other team principals? What's the relationship like? I, I think uh, it, it's a lot of guys I get on pretty well, actually. And a lot of guys have got a respectful relationship. It's like in any other industry, you know, some people you work better together because of personalities, but I, I wouldn't say I, I, I wouldn't say I have, I have a bad uh, uh, relationship with anybody. We, we've been to a few of the races. We were in Miami and Montreal and now Silverstone. How, how do they compare with each other race to race? I mean, it is amazing how many there are and how much you guys travel. Yeah, I mean, again, <laughs> I, I, I give you my opinion on that one. I think F1, a lot of people, old, old style fans, they say, oh, it's too many races. Uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, now the, but the races now are so different. We have got next year 24 races and they are not cookie cutter races anymore. I see it. It's so different. If you, if you compare a Miami or what Vegas, we all think will be with a Silverstone or Spa, it's very different. The main thing is always the race, obviously, but the, the, the surroundings are completely different. The, uh, in Spa, the hardcore fans go, you know, which want to see real race car, just race cars, nothing else. Miami, there is a lot of Miami going around in the Miami race, you know, wanted to be seen, a lot, a lot of parties, a lot of entertainment, but the race is still the, uh, 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 the most important. Then, as you well know, we have got six race weekends with a sprint car uh, race, with a sprint weekend where we have got a race on Saturday. I think if you would have 24 races cookie cutter, people would run out of enthusiasm to watch them. But now every race, not every, there's a lot of different races. Then we have got the night races in uh, Singapore, you know, it's so different. We've got street races, we've got Monte Carlo. So even if you watch 24 races, you're never watching the same. There's always an element of different in it, you know, and it, which makes it more interesting. That's what I think, because 24 cookie cutter races, even for me, which I'm, I mean, I'm doing racing since more than 30 years. I don't know anything better than that, you know, it would get really almost boring, but with having this diversity of uh, elements in, involved in it, I think it keeps it interesting. So I think that's pretty cool, you know, and as you said, Miami to Spa, you think it's a different, almost a different sport, you know, but the sport is the same. It's just the surrounding is different. We got a chance to be on the gridwalk, which was an amazing experience. What, what are you doing there 20 minutes before the race? What's going through your mind and, and what are you actually doing? I just always hope not, nothing happens which shouldn't have happening. You know, it's like a car doesn't start or something like this. And then you, it goes through your mind. Actually, it's a pretty cool place to be on, you know, uh, 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 in life. I mean, you experience that, you said, you know, it's, a, uh, it's pretty cool to, to be standing there. But the, the main thing there is I listen to the radio, seeing uh, everything is okay. Not that I can do something if a car doesn't start, but at least you just try to always be ahead of what is happening, seeing if something strange happens, you have to do something. But otherwise, if you want to change anything, it's too late on the grid. <laughs> what, what else about race weekends? What, how do you spend your time? Oh, it's, it's spent in, in all aspects. I mean, I, I, on, on Thursday, I normally try to get most of my media work out of the way. There's always a little bit to do uh, on, on the other days, but then 
on Friday, the guest staff that come in, the, uh, the sponsors, the partners, and spend a little bit of time with them. But then uh, you've got the, the normal meetings with the other team principals, with FOM, uh, you know, the people you need to meet at the race weekend. Then I go to all the briefings, or I say to all when I can, because sometimes I've got something else to do. But if I don't go to a briefing, I get the, the summary from one of the engineers or from the head engineer, which was said that I know that I'm abreast what they're doing with the car. I always want to be informed, speak a little bit with the drivers. Uh, uh, and uh, the weekend goes pretty quick. It's, it's quite intense, you know, and uh, then you go racing. Then you think about what happened. Uh, did we miss something? Just trying to ask questions and uh, trying to get the right answers. What's your favorite part? Going qualifying and racing. Qualifying? And racing. The and two racing. things where, where we compete. That's what I like most. That's for the, 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 the sprint races. I love because we do more of that, you know, because then that is, that is what I like. That's for why I'm doing it, you know. Going racing, it's intense. It's like you need to be on it. You can see if you have done things right, if you've got the right people around you. That is what I love. Gunther, thank you so much for taking the time. So yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me.